Chapter 11 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 11. How to Remember Names. The phase of memory connected with the remembrance or recollection of names probably is of greater interest to the majority of persons than are any of the associated phases of the subject. On all hands are to be found people who are embarrassed by their failure to recall the name of someone whom they feel they know, but whose name has escaped them. This failure to remember the names of persons undoubtedly interferes with the business and professional success of many persons, and, on the other hand, the ability to recall names readily has aided many persons in the struggle for success. It would seem that there are a greater number of persons deficient in this phase of memory than in any other. As Holbrook has said, the memory of names is a subject with which most persons must have a more than passing interest. The number of persons who never or rarely forget a name is exceedingly small. The number of those who have a poor memory for them is very large. The reason for this is partly a defect of mental development and partly a matter of habit. In either case, it may be overcome by effort. I have satisfied myself by experience and observation that a memory for names may be increased not only two, but a hundredfold. You will find that the majority of successful men have been able to recall the faces and names of those with whom they came in contact, and it is an interesting subject for speculation as to just how much of their success was due to this faculty. Socrates is said to have easily remembered the names of all of his students, and his classes numbered thousands in the course of a year. Xenophon is said to have known the name of every one of his soldiers, which faculty was shared by Washington and Napoleon also. Trajan is said to have known the names of all of the Praetorian guards, numbering about 12,000. Pericles knew the face and name of every one of the citizens of Athens. Cineus is said to have known the names of all of the citizens of Rome. Themistocles knew the names of twenty thousand Athenians. Lucius Scipio could call by name every citizen of Rome. John Wesley could recall the names of thousands of persons whom he had met in his travels. Henry Clay was specially developed in this phase of memory, and there was a tradition among his followers that he remembered every one whom he met. Blaine had a similar reputation. There have been many theories advanced and explanations offered to account for the fact that the recollection of names is far more difficult than any other form of the activities of the memory. We shall not take up your time in going over these theories, but shall proceed upon the theory now generally accepted by the best authorities, that is, that the difficulty in the recollection of names is caused by the fact that names in themselves are uninteresting, and therefore do not attract or hold the attention as do other objects presented to the mind. There is, of course, to be remembered the fact that sound impressions are apt to be more difficult of recollection than sight impressions, but the lack of interesting qualities in names is believed to be the principal obstacle and difficulty. Fuller says of this matter, A proper noun or name, when considered independently of accidental features of coincidence with something that is familiar, doesn't mean anything. For this reason, a mental picture of it is not easily formed, which accounts for the fact that the primitive, tedious way of rote or repetition is that ordinarily employed to impress a proper noun on the memory, while a common noun, being represented by some object having shape or appearance in the physical or mental perception, can thus be seen or imagined. In other words, a mental image of it can be formed, and the name identified afterwards, 
through associating it with this mental image. We think that the case is fully stated in this quotation. But in spite of this difficulty, persons have and can greatly improve their memory of names. Many who were originally very deficient in this respect have not only improved the faculty far beyond its former condition, but have also developed exceptional ability in this special phase of memory, so that they became noted for their unfailing recollection of the names of those with whom they came in contact. Perhaps the best way to impress upon you the various methods that may be used for this purpose would be to relate to you the actual experience of a gentleman employed in a bank in one of the large cities of this country, who made a close study of the subject and developed himself far beyond the ordinary. Starting with a remarkably poor memory for names, he is now known to his associates as the man who never forgets a name. This gentleman first took a number of courses in secret methods of developing the memory, but after thus spending much money, he expressed his disgust with the whole idea of artificial memory training. He then started in to study the subject from the point of view of the new psychology, putting into effect all of the tested principles and improving upon some of their details. We have had a number of conversations with this gentleman and have found that his experience confirms many of our own ideas and theories, and the fact that he has demonstrated the correctness of the principles to such a remarkable degree renders his case one worthy of being stated in the direction of affording a guide and method for others who wish to develop their memory of names. The gentleman, who we shall call Mr. X, decided that the first thing for him to do was to develop his faculty of receiving clear and distinct sound impressions. In doing this, he followed the plan outlined by us in our chapter on training the ear. He persevered and practiced along these lines until his hearing became very acute. He made a study of voices until he could classify them and analyze their characteristics. Then he found that he could hear names in a manner before impossible to him. That is, instead of merely catching a vague sound of a name, he would hear it so clearly and distinctly that a firm registration would be obtained on the records of his memory. For the first time in his life, names began to mean something to him. He paid attention to every name he heard, just as he did to every note he handled. He would repeat a name to himself after hearing it, and would thus strengthen the impression. If he came across an unusual name, he would write it down several times at the first opportunity, thus obtaining the benefit of a double sense impression, adding eye impression or ear impression. All this, of course, aroused his interest in the subject of names in general, which led him to the next step in his progress. Mr. X then began to study names, their origin, their peculiarities, their differences, points of resemblances, etc. He made a hobby of names, and evinced all the joy of a collector when he was able to stick the pins of attention through the specimen of a new and unfamiliar species of name. He began to collect names, just as others collect beetles, stamps, coins, etc., and took quite a pride in his collection and in his knowledge of the subject. He read books on names from the libraries, giving their origin, etc. He had the Dickens delight in queer names, and would amuse his friends by relating the funny names he had seen on signs and otherwise. He took a small city directory home with him, and would run over the pages in the evening, looking up new names and classifying old ones into groups. He found that some names were derived from animals, and put these into a class by themselves, the lions, wolves, foxes, lambs, hares, etc. Others were put into color group, 
blacks, greens, whites, grays, blues, etc. Others belong to the bird family. Crows, hawks, birds, drakes, cranes, doves, jays, etc. Others belong to trades, millers, smiths, coopers, malsters, carpenters, bakers, painters, etc. Others were trees, chestnuts, oakleys, walnuts, cherries, pines, etc. Then there were hills and dales, fields and mountains, lanes and brooks. Some were strong, others were gay, others were savage, others noble, and so on. It would take a whole book to tell you what the man found out about names. He came near becoming a crank on the subject. But his hobby began to manifest excellent results, for his interest had been awakened to an unusual degree. And he was becoming very proficient in his recollection of names, for they now meant something to him. He easily recalled all the regular customers at his bank, quite a number, by the way, for the bank was a large one, and many occasional depositors were delighted to have themselves called by name by our friend. Occasionally he would meet with a name that balked him, in which case he would repeat it over to himself, and write it a number of times until he had mastered it. After that it never escaped him. Mr. X would always repeat a name when it was spoken, and would at the same time look intently at the person bearing it, thus seeming to fix the two together in his mind at the same time. When he wanted them, they would be found in each other's company. He also acquired the habit of visualizing the name, that is, he would see its letters in his mind's eye as a picture. This he regarded as a most important point, and we thoroughly agree with him. He used the law of association in the direction of associating a new man with a well-remembered man of the same name. A new Mr. Schmitzenberger would be associated with an old customer of the same name. When he would see the new man, he would think of the old one, and the name would flash into his mind. To sum up the whole method, however, it may be said that the gist of the thing was in taking an interest in names in general. In this way, an uninteresting subject was made interesting, and a man always has a good memory for the things in which he is interested. The case of Mr. X is an extreme one, and the results obtained were beyond the ordinary. But if you will take a leaf from his book, you may obtain the same results in the degree that you work for it. Make a study of names, start a collection, and you will have no trouble in developing a memory for them. This is the whole thing in a nutshell. End of chapter 11 Of, of Memory how to develop, train, and use it. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 12 How to Remember Faces The memory of faces is closely connected with the memory of names, and yet the two are not always associated for there are many people who easily remember faces and yet forget names and vice versa. In some ways, however, the memory of faces is a necessary precedent for the recollection of the names of people. For unless we recall the face, we are unable to make the necessary association with the name of the person. We have given a number of instances of face memory in our chapter on name memory, in which are given instances of the wonderful memory of celebrated individuals who acquired a knowledge and memory of the thousands of citizens of a town or city or the soldiers of an army. In this chapter, however, 
we shall pay attention only to the subject of the recollection of the features of persons, irrespective of their names. This faculty is possessed by all persons, but in varying degrees. Those in whom it is well developed seem to recognize the faces of persons whom they have met years before, and to associate them with their circumstances in which they last met them, even where the name escapes the memory. Others seem to forget a face the moment it passes from view, and fail to recognize the same persons whom they met only a few hours before, much to their mortification and chagrin. Detectives, newspaper reporters, and others who come in contact with many people usually have this faculty largely developed, for it becomes a necessity of their work, and their interest and attention is rendered active thereby. Public men often have this faculty largely developed by reason of the necessities of their life. It is said that James G. Blaine never forgot the face of anyone whom he had met and conversed with a few moments. This faculty rendered him very popular in political life. In this respect he resembled Henry Clay, who was noted for his memory of faces. It is related of Clay that he once paid a visit of a few hours to a small town in Mississippi on an electioneering tour. Amidst the throng surrounding him was an old man with one eye missing. The old fellow pressed forward, crying out that he was sure that Henry Clay would remember him. Clay took a sharp look at him and said, I met you in Kentucky many years ago, did I not? Yes replied the man. "'Did you lose your eye since then?' asked Clay. "'Yes, several years after,' replied the old man. "'Turn your face sideways so that I can see your profile,' said Clay. The man did so. Then Clay smiled triumphantly, saying, "'I've got you now. Weren't you on that jury in the Innes case at Frankfurt?' that I tried in the United States court over twenty years ago? Yes, sirree, said the man. I knowed that you know me, and I told him you would. And the crowd gave a whoop, and Clay knew that he was safe in that town and county. Vidoc, the celebrated French detective, is said to have never forgotten the face of a criminal whom he had once seen. A celebrated instance of this power on his part is that of the case of De La Franche, the forger who escaped from prison and dwelt in foreign lands for over twenty years. After that time he returned to Paris feeling secure from detection, having become bald, losing an eye, and having his nose badly mutilated. Moreover, he disguised himself and wore a beard in order to still further evade detection. One day Vidoc met him on the street and recognized him at once, his arrest and return to prison following. Instances of this kind could be multiplied indefinitely, but the student will have had a sufficient acquaintance with persons who possess this faculty developed to a large degree, so that further illustration is scarcely necessary. The way to develop this phase of memory is akin to that urged in the development of other phases, the cultivation of interest, and the bestowal of attention. Faces, as a whole, are not apt to prove interesting. It is only by analyzing and classifying them that the study begins to grow of interest to us. The study of a good elementary work on physiognomy is recommended to those wishing to develop the faculty of remembering faces, for in such a work the student is led to notice the different kinds of noses, ears, eyes, chins, foreheads, etc., such notice and recognition tending to induce an interest in the subject of features. A rudimentary course of study in drawing faces, particularly in profile, will also tend to make one take notice, and will awaken interest. If you are required to draw a nose, particularly from memory, you will be apt to give it your interested attention. 
the matter of interest is vital if you were shown a man and told that the next time you met and recognized him he would hand you over five hundred dollars you would be very apt to study his face carefully and to recognize him later on whereas the same man if introduced casually as a mr jones would arouse no interest and the chances of recognition would be slim halleck says every time we enter a street car we see different types of people and there is a great deal to be noticed about each type every human countenance shows its past history to one who knows how to look successful gamblers often become so expert in noticing the slightest change of an opponent's facial expression that they will estimate the strength of his hand by the involuntary signs which appear in the face and which are frequently checked the instant they appear of all classes perhaps artists are more apt to form a clear-cut image of the features of persons whom they meet particularly if they are portrait painters there are instances of celebrated portrait painters who were able to execute a good portrait after having once carefully studied the face of the sitter their memory enabling them to visualize the features at will some celebrated teachers of drawing have instructed their scholars to take a sharp hasty glance at a nose an eye an ear or chin and then to so clearly visualize it that they could draw it perfectly it is all a matter of interest attention and practice sir francis galton cites the instance of a french teacher who trained his pupils so thoroughly in this direction that after a few months practice they had no difficulty in summoning images at will in holding them steady and in drawing them correctly he says of the faculty of visualization thus used a faculty that is of importance in all technical and artistic occupations that gives accuracy to our perceptions and justice to our generalizations is starved by lazy disuse instead of being cultivated judiciously in such a way as will on the whole bring the best return i believe that a serious study of the best means of developing and utilizing this faculty without prejudice to the practice of abstract thought in symbols is one of the many pressing desiderata in the yet unformed science of education fuller relates the method of a celebrated painter which method has been since taught by many teachers of both drawing and memory he relates it as follows the celebrated painter leonardo da vinci invented a most ingenious method for identifying faces and by it is said to have been able to reproduce from memory any face that he had once carefully scrutinized he drew all the possible forms of the nose mouth chin eyes ears and forehead numbered them one two three four etc and committed them thoroughly to memory then whenever he saw a face that he wished to draw or paint from memory he noted in his mind that it was chin four eyes two nose five ears six or whatever the combinations might be and by retaining the analysis in his memory he could reconstruct the face at any time we could scarcely ask the student to attempt so complicated a system and yet a modification of it would prove useful that is if you would begin to form a classification of several kind of noses say about seven the well-known roman jewish grecian giving you the general classes in connection with straight crooked pug and all the other varieties you would soon recognize noses when you saw them and the same with mouths a few classes being found to cover the majority of cases but of all the features the eye is the most expressive and the one most easily remembered when clearly noticed detectives rely much upon the expression of the eye 
if you ever fully catch the expression of a person's eye, you will be very apt to recognize it thereafter. Therefore concentrate on eyes in studying faces. A good plan in developing this faculty is to visualize the faces of persons you have met during the day, in the evening. Try to develop the faculty of visualizing the features of those whom you know. This will start you off right. Draw them in your mind. See them with your mind's eye until you can visualize the features of very old friends. Then do the same with acquaintances, and so on, until you are able to visualize the features of everyone you know. Then start on to add to your list by recalling in the imagination the features of strangers whom you meet. By a little practice of this kind, you will develop a great interest in faces and your memory of them, and the power to recall them will increase rapidly. The secret is to study faces, to be interested in them. In this way you add zest to the task and make a pleasure of a drudgery. The study of photographs is also a great aid in this work, but study them in detail, not as a whole. If you can arouse sufficient interest in features and faces, you will have no trouble in remembering and recalling them. The two things go together. End of chapter 12「Thirteen of Memory: How to Develop, Train, and Use It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory: How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 13: How to Remember Places. There is a great difference in the various degrees of development of the sense of locality in different persons but these differences may be traced directly to the degree of memory of that particular phase or faculty of the mind which in turn depends upon the degree of attention interest and use which has been bestowed upon the faculty in question the authorities on phrenology define the faculty of locality as follows cognizance of place recollection of the looks of places roads sceneries and the location of objects, where on a page ideas are to be found, and position generally, the geographical faculty, the desire to see places, and have the ability to find them. Persons in whom this faculty is developed to the highest degree seem to have an almost intuitive idea of direction, place, and position. They never get lost or mixed up regarding direction or place. They remember the places they visit and their relation in space to each other. Their minds are like maps upon which are engraved the various roads, streets, and objects of sight in every direction. When these people think of China, Labrador, Terra del Fuego, Norway, Cape of Good Hope, Tibet, or any other place, they seem to think of it in this direction or that direction, rather than as a vague place situated in a vague direction. Their minds think north, south, east, or west, as the case may be, when they consider a given place. Shading down by degrees, we find people at the other pole of the faculty, who seem to find it impossible to remember any direction or locality or relation in space. Such people are constantly losing themselves in their own towns and fear to trust themselves in a strange place. They have no sense of direction or place and fail to recognize a street or scene which they have visited recently, not to speak of those which they traveled over in time past. Between these two poles or degrees there is a vast difference, and it is difficult to realize that it is all a matter of use, interest, and attention. That it is but this may be proven by anyone who will take the trouble and pains 
to develop the faculty and memory of locality within his mind. Many have done this, and anyone else may do likewise if the proper methods be employed. The secret of the development of the faculty and memory of place and locality is akin to that mentioned in the preceding chapter, in connection with the development of the memory for names. The first thing necessary is to develop an interest in the subject. One should begin to take notice of the direction of the streets or roads over which he travels, the landmarks, the turns of the road, the natural objects along the way. He should study maps until he awakens a new interest in them, just as did the man who used the directory in order to take an interest in names. He should procure a small geography and study direction, distances, location, shape and form of countries, etc., not as a mere mechanical thing, but as a live subject of interest. If there were a large sum of money awaiting your coming in certain sections of the globe, you would manifest a decided interest in the direction, locality, and position of those places, and the best way to reach them. Before long, you would be a veritable reference book regarding those special places. Or, if your sweetheart were waiting for you in some such place, you would do likewise. The whole thing lies in the degree of want to regarding the matter. Desire awakens interest. Interests employ attention. And attention brings use, development, and memory. Therefore, you must first want to develop the faculty of locality, and want to hard enough. The rest is a mere matter of detail. One of the first things to do, after arousing an interest, is to carefully note the landmarks and relative positions of the streets or roads over which you travel. So many people travel along a new street or road in an absent-minded manner, taking no notice of the lay of the land as they proceed. This is fatal to place memory. You must take notice of the thoroughfares and the things along the way. Pause at the crossroads, or the street corners, and note the landmarks, and the general directions and relative positions, until they are finally imprinted on your mind. Begin to see how many things you can remember regarding even a little exercise walk, and when you have returned home, go over the trip in your mind, and see how much of the direction and how many of the landmarks you are able to remember. Take out your pencil, and endeavor to make a map of your route, giving the general directions, and noting the street names, and principal objects of interest. Fix the idea of north in your mind when starting, and keep your bearings by it during your whole trip and in your map-making. You'll be surprised how much interest you will soon develop in this map-making. It will get to be quite a game, and you will experience pleasure in your increasing proficiency in it. When you go out for a walk, go in a roundabout way taking as many turns and twists as possible, in order to exercise your faculty of locality and direction. But always note carefully direction and general course, so that you may reproduce it correctly on your map when you return. If you have a city map, compare it with your own little map, and also retrace your route in imagination on the map, with a city map or road map, you may get lots of amusement by retraveling the route of your little journeys. Always note the names of the various streets over which you travel, as well as those which you cross during your walk. Note them down upon your map, and you will find that you will develop a rapidly improving memory in this direction, because you have awakened interest and bestowed attention. Take a pride in your map-making. If you have a companion, endeavor to beat each other at this game, both traveling over the same route together, and then seeing which one can remember the greatest number of details of the journey. 
Akin to this, and supplementary to it, is the plan of selecting a route to be traveled, on your city map, endeavoring to fix in your mind the general directions, names of streets, turns, return journey, etc., before you start. Begin by mapping out a short trip in this way, and then increase it every day. After mapping out a trip, lay aside your map and travel it in person. If you like, take along the map and puzzle out variations from time to time. Get the map habit in every possible variation and form, but do not depend upon the map exclusively, but instead endeavor to correlate the printed map with the mental map that you are building in your brain. If you are about to take a journey to a strange place, study your maps carefully before you go, and exercise your memory in reproducing them with a pencil. Then, as you travel along, compare places with your map, and you will find that you will take an entirely new interest in the trip. It will begin by meaning something to you. If about to visit a strange city, procure a map of it before starting, and begin by noting the cardinal points of the compass. Study the map the directions of the principal streets and the relative positions of the principal points of interest, buildings, etc. In this way, you not only develop your memory of places and render yourself proof against being lost, but you also provide a source of new and great interest in your visit. The above suggestions are capable of the greatest expansion and variation on the part of anyone who practices them. The whole thing depends upon the taking notice and using the attention, and those things in turn depend upon the taking of interest in the subject. If anyone will wake up and take interest in the subject of locality and direction, he may develop himself along the lines of place memory to an almost incredible degree, in a comparatively short time at that. There is no other phase of memory that so quickly responds to use and exercise as this one. We have in mind a lady who was notoriously deficient in the memory of place, and was sure to lose herself a few blocks from her stopping place, wherever she might be. She seemed absolutely devoid of the sense of direction or locality, and often lost herself in the hotel corridors, notwithstanding the fact that she traveled all over the world with her husband for years. The trouble undoubtedly arose from the fact that she depended altogether upon her husband as a pilot, the couple being inseparable. Well, the husband died and the lady lost her pilot. Instead of giving up in despair, she began to rise to the occasion. Having no pilot, she had to pilot herself, and she was forced to wake up and notice. She was compelled to travel for a couple of years in order to close up certain business matters of her husband's, for she was a good businesswoman in spite of her lack of development along this one line and in order to get around safely, she was forced to take an interest in where she was going. Before the two years' travels were over, she was as good a traveler as her husband had ever been, and was frequently called upon as a guide by others in whose company she chanced to be. She explained it by saying, "'Why, I don't know just how I did it. I just had to, that's all. I just did it. Another example of a woman's because, you see. What this good lady just did was accomplished by an instinctive following of the plan which we have suggested to you. She just had to use maps and to take notice. That is the whole story. So true are the principles underlying this method of developing the place memory that one deficient in it providing he will arouse intense interest and will stick to it, may develop the faculty to such an extent that he may almost rival a cat which always came back, 
or the dog which you couldn't lose. The Indians, Arabs, Gypsies, and other people of the plain, forest, desert, and mountains have this faculty so highly developed that it seems almost like an extra sense. It is all this matter of taking notice, sharpened by continuous need, use, and exercise to a high degree. The mind will respond to the need if the person, like the lady, just has to. The laws of attention and association will work wonders when actively called into play by interest or need, followed by exercise and use. There is no magic in the process. Just want to and keep at it, that's all. Do you want to hard enough? Have you the determination to keep at it? End of chapter 13of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 14. How to Remember Numbers. The faculty of number, that is, the faculty of knowing, recognizing, and remembering figures in the abstract, and in their relation to each other, differs very materially among different individuals. To some, figures and numbers are apprehended and remembered with ease, while to others they possess no interest, attraction, or affinity, and consequently are not apt to be remembered. It is generally admitted by the best authorities that the memorizing of dates, figures, numbers, etc., is the most difficult of any of the phases of memory. But all agree that the faculty may be developed by practice and interest. There have been instances of persons having this faculty of the mind developed to a degree almost incredible, and other instances of persons having started with an aversion to figures and then developing an interest which resulted in their acquiring a remarkable degree of proficiency along these lines. Many of the celebrated mathematicians and astronomers developed wonderful memories for figures. Herschel is said to have been able to remember all the details of intricate calculations in his astronomical computations, even to the figures of the fractions. It is said that he was able to perform the most intricate calculations mentally, without the use of pen or pencil, and then dictated to his assistant the entire details of the process, including the final results. Tycho Brahe, the astronomer, also possessed a similar memory. It is said that he rebelled at being compelled to refer to the printed tables of square roots and cube roots, and set to work to memorize the entire set of tables, which almost incredible task he accomplished in a half day. This required the memorizing of over 75,000 figures, and their relations to each other. Euler the mathematician became blind in his old age, and being unable to refer to his tables, memorized them. It is said that he was able to repeat from recollection the first six powers of all the numbers from one to one hundred. Wallace the mathematician was a prodigy in this respect. He is reported to have been able to mentally extract the square root of a number to forty decimal places, and on one occasion mentally extracted the cube root of a number consisting of thirty figures. Days is said to have mentally multiplied two numbers of one hundred figures each. A youth named Mangiamel was able to perform the most remarkable feats in mental arithmetic. The reports show that upon a celebrated test before members of the French Academy of Sciences, he was able to extract the cube root of 3,796,416 in 30 seconds, and the tenth root of 282,475,289 in 3 minutes. 
he also immediately solved the following question put to him by Arago. What number has the following proportion? That if five times the number be subtracted from the cube, plus five times the square of the number, and nine times the square of the number, be subtracted from that result, the remainder will be zero. The answer, five, was given immediately, without putting down a figure on paper or board. It is related that a cashier of a Chicago bank was able to mentally restore the accounts of the bank, which had been destroyed in the great fire in that city, and his account, which was accepted by the bank and the depositors, was found to agree perfectly with the other memoranda in the case, the work performed by him being solely the work of his memory. Bidder was able to tell instantly the number of farthings in the sum of 868 pounds, 42 shillings, 121 pence. Buxton mentally calculated the number of cubical eighths of an inch there were in a quadrangular mass, 23,145,789 yards long, 2,642,732 732 yards wide, and 54,965 yards in thickness. He also figured out mentally the dimensions of an irregular estate of about a thousand acres, giving the contents in acres and perches, then reducing them to square inches, and then reducing them to square hairbreadths, estimating 2,304 to the square inch, 48 to each side. The mathematical prodigy, Zira Colburn, was perhaps the most remarkable of any of these remarkable people. When a mere child, he began to develop the most amazing qualities of mind regarding figures. He was able to instantly make the mental calculation of the exact number of seconds or minutes there was in a given time. On one occasion, he calculated the number of minutes and seconds contained in 48 years, the answer, 25,228,800 minutes, and 1,513,728,000 seconds, being given almost instantaneously. He could instantly multiply any number of one to three figures by another number consisting of the same number of figures, the factors of any number consisting of six or seven figures, the square and cube roots, and the prime numbers of any numbers given him. He mentally raised the number eight, progressively, to its sixteenth power, the result being two hundred and eighty-one trillion, four hundred and seventy-four billion, nine hundred and seventy-six million, seven hundred and ten thousand, six hundred and fifty-six, and gave the square root of one hundred and six thousand, nine hundred and twenty-nine, which was five. He mentally extracted the cube root of two hundred and sixty-eight million, three hundred and thirty-six thousand, one hundred and twenty-five, and the squares of two hundred and forty-four million, nine hundred and ninety-nine thousand seven hundred and fifty-five and one billion two hundred and twenty-four million nine hundred and ninety-eight thousand seven hundred and fifty-five in five seconds he calculated the cube root of four hundred and thirteen billion nine hundred and ninety-three million three hundred and forty-eight thousand six hundred and seventy-seven he found the factors of four billion two hundred and ninety four million nine hundred and sixty seven thousand two hundred and ninety seven which had previously been considered to be a prime number he mentally calculated the square of nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine which is nine hundred and ninety nine billion nine hundred and ninety eight million and one and then multiplied that number by forty nine and the product by the same number, and the whole by twenty-five, the latter as extra measure. 
the great difficulty in remembering numbers to the majority of persons is the fact that numbers do not mean anything to them that is the numbers are thought of only in their abstract phase and nature and are consequently far more difficult to remember than are the impressions received from the senses of sight or sound the remedy however becomes apparent when we recognize the source of the difficulty the remedy is make the number the subject of sound and sight impressions attach the abstract idea of the numbers to the sense of impressions of sight or sound or both according to which are the best developed in your particular case it may be difficult for you to remember 1848 as an abstract thing but comparatively easy for you to remember the sound of 1848 or the shape and appearance of 1848 if you will repeat a number to yourself so that you grasp the sound impression of it or else visualize it so that you can remember having seen it then you will be far more apt to remember it than if you merely think of it without reference to sound or form you may forget that the number of a certain store or house is thirty nine forty eight but you may easily remember the sound of the spoken words thirty nine forty eight or the form of thirty nine forty eight as it appeared to your sight on the door of the place in the latter case you associate the number with the door and when you visualize the door you visualize the number k speaking of visualization or the reproduction of mental images of things to be remembered says those who have been distinguished for their power to carry out long and intricate processes of mental calculation owe it to the same cause taine says children accustomed to calculate in their heads write mentally with chalk on an imaginary board the figures in question then all their partial operations then the final sum so that they see internally the different lines of white figures with which they are concerned young colburn who had never been at school and did not know how to read or write said that when making his calculations he saw them clearly before him another said that he saw the numbers he was working with as if they had been written on a slate bidder says if i perform a sum mentally it always proceeds in a visible form in my mind indeed i can conceive of no other way possible of doing mental arithmetic we have known office boys who could never remember the number of an address until it were distinctly repeated to them several times then they memorized the sound and never forgot it others forget the sounds or fail to register them in the mind but after once seeing the number on the door of an office or store could repeat it at a moment's notice saying that they mentally could see the figures on the door you will find by a little questioning that the majority of people remember figures or numbers in this way and that very few can remember them as abstract things for that matter it is difficult for the majority of persons to even think of a number abstractly try it yourself and ascertain whether you do not remember the number as either a sound of words or else as the mental image or visualization of the form of the figures and by the way whichever it happens to be sight or sound that particular kind of remembrance is your best way of remembering numbers and consequently gives you the lines upon which you should proceed to develop this phase of memory the law of association may be used advantageously in memorizing numbers for instance we know of a person who remembered the number one hundred and eighty six thousand the number of miles per second traveled by light waves in the ether by associating it with the number of his father's former place of business one eighty six another remembered his telephone number one eight seven six by recalling the date of the declaration of independence another the number of states in the union 
by associating it with the last two figures of the number of his place of business. But by far the better way to memorize dates, special numbers connected with events, etc., is to visualize the picture of the event with the picture of the date or number, thus combining the two things into a mental picture, the association of which will be preserved when the picture is recalled. Verse of doggerel, such as, In 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue, or, In 1861 our country's civil war begun, etc., have their places and uses, but it is far better to cultivate the sight or sound of a number than to depend upon cumbersome associative methods based on artificial links and pegs. Finally, as we have said in the preceding chapters, before one can develop a good memory of a subject, he must first cultivate an interest in that subject. Therefore, if you will keep your interest in figures alive by working out a few problems in mathematics once in a while, you will find that figures will begin to have a new interest for you. A little elementary arithmetic, used with interest, will do more to start you on the road to how to remember numbers than a dozen textbooks on the subject. In memory, the three rules are interest, attention, and exercise and the last is the most important, for without it the others fail. You will be surprised to see how many interesting things there are in figures as you proceed. The task of going over the elementary arithmetic will not be nearly so dry as when you were a child. You will uncover all sorts of queer things in relation to numbers. Just as a sample, let us call your attention to a few. Take the figure 1 and place behind it a number of knots, thus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, as many knots or ciphers as you wish. Then divide the number by the figure 7. You will find that the result is always this 142,857 then another 142,857, and so on to infinity if you wish to carry the calculation that far. These six figures will be repeated over and over again. Then multiply this 142,857 by the figure 7, and your product will be all nines. Then take any number and set it down, placing beneath it a reversal of itself, and subtract the latter from the former, thus 117761909 minus 9091677171 equals 26845138. And you will find that the result will always reduce to 9, and is always a multiple of 9. Take any number composed of two or more figures and subtract from it the added sum of its separate figures, and the result is always a multiple of nine, thus 184 minus 1 plus 8 plus 4 equals 13 equals 171 divided by 9 equals 19. We mention these familiar examples merely to remind you that there is much more of interest in mere figures than many would suppose. If you can arouse your interest in them, then you will be well started on the road to the memorizing of numbers. Let figures and numbers mean something to you, and the rest will be merely a matter of detail. End of chapter 14 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 15. How to Remember Music. 
Like all of the other faculties of the mind, that of music or tune is manifested in varying degrees by different individuals. To some, music seems to be almost instinctively grasped, while to others it is acquired only by great effort and much labor. To some, harmony is natural, and in harmony a matter of repulsion, while others fail to recognize the difference between the two, except in extreme cases. Some seem to be the very soul of music, while others have no conception of what the soul of music may be. Then there is manifested the different phases of the knowledge of music. Some play correctly by ear, but are clumsy and inefficient when it comes to playing by note. Others play very correctly in a mechanical manner, but fail to retain the memory of music which they have heard. It is indeed a good musician who combines within himself or herself both of the two last-mentioned faculties, the ear perception of music and the ability to execute correctly from notes. There are many cases of record in which extraordinary powers of memory of music have been manifested. Fuller relates the following instances of this particular phase of memory. Carolyn, the greatest of Irish bards, once met a noted musician and challenged him to a test of their respective musical abilities. The defi was accepted, and Carolyn's rival played on his violin one of Vivaldi's most difficult concertos. On the conclusion of the performance, Carolyn, who had never heard the piece before, took his harp and played the concerto through from beginning to end without making a single error. His rival thereupon yielded the palm, thoroughly satisfied of Carolyn's superiority, as well he might be. Beethoven could retain in his memory any musical composition, however complex, that he had listened to, and could reproduce most of it. He could play from memory every one of the compositions in Bach's well-tempered clavichord, there being forty-eight preludes, and the same number of figures which in intricacy of movement and difficulty of execution are almost unexampled, as each of these compositions is written in the most abstruse style of counterpoint. Mozart, at four years of age, could remember note for note elaborate solos and concertos which he had heard. He could learn a minuet in half an hour, and even composed short pieces at that early age. At six he was able to compose without the aid of an instrument, and continued to advance rapidly in musical memory and knowledge. When fourteen years old he went to Rome in Holy Week. At the Sistine Chapel was performed each day Allegri's Miseraire, the score of which Mozart wished to obtain but he learned that no copies were allowed to be made. He listened attentively to the performance, at the conclusion of which he wrote the whole score from memory without an error. Another time Mozart was engaged to contribute an original composition to be formed by a noted violinist and himself at Vienna before the Emperor Joseph. On arriving at the appointed place, Mozart discovered that he had forgotten to bring his part. Nothing dismayed, he placed a blank sheet of paper before him and played his part through from memory without a mistake. When the opera of Don Giovanni was first performed, there was no time to copy the score for the harpsichord, but Mozart was equal to the occasion. He conducted the entire opera and played the harpsichord accompaniment to the songs and choruses without a note before him. There are many well-attested instances of Mendelssohn's remarkable musical memory. He once gave a grand concert in London at which his overture to Midsummer Night's Dream was produced. There was only one copy of the full score, which was taken charge of by the organist of St. Paul's Cathedral who unfortunately left it in a hackney coach, whereupon Mendelssohn wrote out another score from memory without an error. At another time, 
when about to direct a public performance of Bach's passion music, he found on mounting the conductor's platform that instead of the score of the work to be performed, that of another composition had been brought by mistake. Without hesitation, Mendelssohn successfully conducted this complicated work from memory, automatically turning over leaf after leaf of the score before him as the performance progressed, so that no feeling of uneasiness might enter the minds of the orchestra and singers. Gottschalk, it is said, could play from memory several thousand compositions, including many of the works of Bach. The noted conductor, Vianessi, rarely has the score before him in conducting an opera, knowing every note of many operas from memory. It will be seen that two phases of memory must enter into the memory of music, the memory of tune and the memory of the notes. The memory of tune, of course, falls into the class of ear impressions, and what has been said regarding them is also applicable to this case. The memory of notes falls into the classification of eye impressions, and the rules of this class of memory applies in this case. As to the cultivation of the memory of tune, the principal advice to be given is that the student take an active interest in all that pertains to the sound of music, and also takes every opportunity for listening to good music and endeavoring to reproduce it in the imagination or memory. Endeavor to enter into the spirit of the music until it becomes a part of yourself. Rest not content with merely hearing it, but lend yourself to a feeling of its meaning. The more the music means to you, the more easily you will remember it. The plan followed by many students, particularly those of vocal music, is to have a few bars of a piece played over to them several times until they are able to hum it correctly, then a few more are added, and then a few more, and so on. Each edition must be reviewed in connection with that which was learned before, so that the chain of association may be kept unbroken. The principle is the same as the child learning his ABC. He remembers B because it follows A. By this constant addition of just a little bit more, accompanied by frequent reviews, long and difficult pieces may be memorized. The memory of notes may be developed by the method above named, the method of learning a few bars well, and then adding a few more, and frequently reviewing as far as you have learned, forging the links of association as you go along by frequent practice. The method being entirely that of eye impression and subject to its rules, you must observe the idea of visualization, that is, learning each bar until you can see it in your mind's eye as you proceed. But in this, as in many other eye impressions, you will find that you will be greatly aided by your memory of the sound of the notes, in addition to their appearance. Try to associate the two as much as possible, so that when you see a note you will hear the sound of it, and when you hear a note sounded, you will see it as it appears on the score. This combining of the impressions of both sight and sound will give you the benefit of the double sense impression, which results in doubling your memory efficiency. In addition to visualizing the notes themselves, the student should add the appearance of the various symbols denoting the key, the time, the movement, expression, etc., so that he may hum the air from the visualized notes with expression and with correct interpretation. Changes of key, time, or movement should be carefully noted in the memorization of the notes. Memorize the feeling of that particular portion of the score, that you may not only see and hear it, but also feel that which you are recalling. We would advise the student to practice memorizing simple songs at first, for various reasons. 
one of these reasons is that these songs lend themselves readily to memorizing and the chain of easy association is usually maintained throughout in this phase of memory as in all others we add the advice to take interest bestow attention and practice and exercise as often as possible you may have tired of these words but they constitute the main principles of the development of a retentive memory things must be impressed upon the memory before they may be recalled this should be remembered in every consideration of the subject end of chapter 15